about the church. Uh, we're talking about the church with a capital C, the body of Christ all around the world. And, uh, and then we're going to pray for this church as part of the church. Um, let me read a couple of verses uh, of scripture to you. I'm going to start with the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 16. Jesus is alone with the disciples on one occasion, and he asked them a question. He says, who do men say that I am? And they said, Jesus, people are saying all kinds of things about you. Some people say that uh, you're Elijah. Some people say that you're Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Some people say that you're John the Baptist, come back from the dead. Then Jesus said to them, what about you? Who do you say that I am? Can I tell you that is the most important question ever? That's the most important question. The answer to that question means everything in this life and it means everything in the next life. Peter always speaks up as he was wont to do. And he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For this was not revealed to you by man, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I'll give to you the keys of the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. How many of you ever wondered what those words mean about binding and loosing? I'll tell you real quick. That has to deal with the authority of a rabbi to say what was permitted in his jurisdiction and what wasn't permitted in his jurisdiction. You know, uh, there was a time in the state of Connecticut where there were some different archdioceses and the archbishop of the archdiocese had a, uh, the authority to determine what rules went in that archdiocese. And so in one part of the state of Connecticut, Catholics could not eat meat on Fridays, but across the river, Catholics could eat meat on Fridays. See, it was the authority of the archbishop to determine that. That's the same thing with the binding and loosing. Uh, it was the authority of the rabbis to say, this is permissible in my jurisdiction, and this is not permissible in my jurisdiction. Jesus passed that kind of authority over to us to say, you know what? Wherever I am, the kingdom of God is with me. It's it's the sphere of God's authority. And I'll tell you what's not permissible in my jurisdiction. Anxiety is not permissible in my jurisdiction. Cancer is not permissible in my jurisdiction. Disease, divorce is not permissible. Abuse is not, addiction is not permissible in my jurisdiction. You know what is permissible in my jurisdiction? The love of God, the wholeness of Jesus Christ, the shalom of Jesus, the wholeness of his own personality. But I digress. We need to talk about the church. Let's read the fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy. The church was born on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out in the upper room. And following that, this is what Luke reports about the church. Luke, uh, Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of the bread. That means communion and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles and all the believers were together, had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods. They gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, ate together. They were glad and uh, with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added daily to their number those who were being saved. I want to tell you that right now in America, we need a revival in theology about the church. The church has taken a lot of hits. Uh, the church has had a lot of really bad press. Sometimes uh, Christians, even unwittingly, uh, put up things that really tantamounts to church bashing. I want to warn you, if you're my friend on Facebook and you ever bash the church, I'm talking about the church with a capital C or Christians, you will hear from me in your private message box. 
Someone put up recently a quote from Gandhi. Uh, well, I would have been a Christian if I had ever seen one. Can I tell you that Gandhi saw only what he wanted to see and he heard only what he wanted to hear and what an affront and what an insult to beautiful believers that I have known in India who love Christ with their whole hearts. My friend, Dr. Paneer, is covered with scars all over his face, his chest, all over his arms uh, from fending off knife attacks from Hindus and from Muslims while he stood and preached the gospel in open air meetings. There are believers who love Jesus in India. There are real Christians in India. So so don't, don't ever put anything up like that, you know, dogging on Christians, because that's just church bashing. And what you're doing unwittingly is you are partnering with an antichrist spirit when you do something like that. So, you know, the church is the Holy Spirit's baby. He gave birth to the church. So don't you ever tell the Holy Spirit he has an ugly baby. So you will find yourself on the wrong side of the Holy Spirit. This is good preaching right here. We need a, a revival in theology about the church. We need a revival in theology about church worship services. Can I tell you, it is important. Sometimes we can't get out of the house and it's okay to turn on a church service on television. We have people watching on live stream. Bless you live streamers. We're, we welcome you this evening. And uh, sometimes, you know, that's good. I like to listen to a preacher now and again when I have a chance. But there's nothing like being together with the people of God in, in a room where the church is gathered. We even need a revival in theology about church buildings. You know, church buildings are spiritual things, too. I want to give you three Greek words real quick tonight. The first Greek word in the New Testament is the word ekklesia. Most places in the New Testament where you see the word church, the Greek word is ekklesia. That's why when you study theology, the study of the church is called ecclesiology. So maybe you've heard about ecclesiastical authorities or ecclesiastical robes or ecclesiastical bodies. It comes from that Greek word, ekklesia. The plain meaning of ekklesia is an assembly. So uh, literally the words are called out or called aside from a distinct group. Uh, a distinct group. In secular vocabulary Greek, uh, and it could be any kind of assembly, but when it's used in the New Testament, it is specifically the assembly of God's people, the meeting together of God's people. A second word in Greek I'm going to give you is kuriakos. Kuriakos. That's the Greek word from which we actually get our English word church. Kind of sounds like, right? Kuriakos church. So the literal meaning of kuriakos is belonging to the Lord. It only appears twice in the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians 11:20, it refers to the regular weekly meetings of believers. In Revelation 1 and verse 10, it refers to the day Sunday. John says, you recall, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. That's kuriakos. So it's a gathering of God's people on Sunday. I want to say that Sunday is the Christian day for worship. Now, we, we worship every day of the week, uh, all seven days of the week. But ever since Jesus came out of the tomb on the first day of the week, on Sunday, that has been the day that believers have gathered together for worship. You know what? I think it's important to set aside a day for the Lord. I think it's important to set aside time to honor Him. Can I tell you, we have made a God out of sports. And moms and dads, I just want to warn you, don't be surprised if you make it a point to always get your kid to a soccer game on time, but church is optional. You, what are you teaching them non-verbally about your priorities? Don't you be surprised when they grow up and, you know, going to church isn't that important to them. You have communicated that to them. Now I'm preaching hard at you. I didn't mean to do that. So I meant to be encouraging, but it's true. All right. Third word is the word synagogue. Uh, and so synagogue means both an assembly of Jewish worshipers and the building in which they meet. Um, in order to distinguish themselves from the Jews, the Christians shied away from the word synagogue and they gravitated towards the word church. Only James uses the word synagogue to describe a Christian worship service. So looking at those three important words, what is the church? First of all, the church is the people who belong to the Lord. 
Secondly, church is their regular gatherings for worship and for fellowship, for teaching under the direction of leaders God has appointed and the church is the buildings in which they meet. You know, people are actually mistaken when they say the church is not a building. That's wrong. The church is not only a building, but it's perfectly biblical to refer to a building such as this one as the church. When you're coming to meet with God's people, whether it's on Saturday night or Sunday morning, or we're here pretty much every night of the week on Friday evening, Tuesday, Wednesday, it's perfectly biblical to say, I am going to church because that's exactly what you're doing. And of course, all believers in Jesus are the church. So biblically speaking, it's nonsense to divorce the concept of the church with a capital C from local expressions of believers meeting in buildings designated for that purpose, for worship and for prayer and for fellowship and for teaching. The church is local churches. Local churches are the church. I'm going to tell you, you should get that in your spirit. Uh, you should embrace that in your spirit because it's good teaching from the Word of God. So I want to tell, talk to you. I want to tell you four things quickly that the church is. First of all, the church is a global community that is the unique product of the finished work of the cross and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The church didn't exist prior to Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It couldn't exist before then. Very interestingly, in the Gospel of Luke, the word church doesn't appear one time, but in the book of Acts, which was also written by Luke, the word church appears 24 times. So for Luke, the church didn't exist prior to Jesus' death and resurrection. It couldn't. The church was only made possible by all those events. The church is God's witness on earth that those events actually took place. The Holy Spirit testifies to those historic events through the church. Paul said whenever we gather together and we share communion, we give a testimony on earth to the death and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus. I read every time we take communion here, I read the scripture for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you what? You do, do you remember it? You show the Lord's death until he comes. The church is unlike any other group on earth. It's unlike any other organization. The church is unlike any other club. It's like any other secular community. It's unlike any other popular movement. It's unlike any other religious community. The church is a community that was supernaturally birthed by the Holy Spirit, and it remains tightly connected by the work of the Holy Spirit. Can I tell you, don't, don't bash the church. Don't bash the church with a capital C. Don't bash any church with a little C. There might be some things that need to be sorted out, but if you bash the church, basically what you're saying to God is, Father, you chose poorly. Jesus, your blood is not very powerful, and Holy Spirit, you're not very good at your job. You would never want to say that, would you? What is the church? Secondly, the church is the people who belong to God on earth. The church are people who are in unique covenant relationship through Jesus. We're sons of God. We're members of God's household. We're heirs of God. We're joint heirs with Jesus. We're the bride of Christ. We're bound to Jesus in a relationship in some mystical way that we've become one with him. We're now part of Christ and he's now part of us. Paul said this is a profound mystery. The church is people whose lives are fully submitted to Jesus' leadership. The church is the kingdom of God on earth. So oftentimes when I talk about building our new church building, I talk about building the kingdom because the church is the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God is the church. The church is what brings the authority of the kingdom. The church is where we experience the kingdom of God. What we experience here in the church is a picture of what will be on earth everywhere someday. We are a forerunner of God's kingdom on earth. So the authority of the Father that's here, the power, the presence of God that's here, one day will be everywhere, and we're a picture of that ahead of time. 
The church is the people who bring God pleasure. What's the church? Number three, the church is God's habitation on earth. Another designation for the church is God's temple or God's building. God's presence on earth is manifest through the church. You know, God can manifest his presence anywhere he chooses, any way he chooses, any time he chooses, and he does do that. We hear reports from all around the world of people who live in countries where the gospel is outlawed. I want to tell you, we need to pray. We need to pray. Christians are being butchered right now from Libya. They're being butchered from the East Coast, the West Coast of Africa, all the way across the Middle East, all the way to uh, Pakistan, all the way into Asia. We need to pray for the church. But there are uh, reports of Jesus appearing personally to people in places where the gospel can't get through. God can do that. Um, I met a man in Kenya who had been a Muslim imam in Mogadishu, Somalia, and Jesus appeared to him one night, and he became a believer in Jesus Christ, and then he had to run for his life. So Jesus can do that. God can do that. But if you want to know where you are always sure to find God's presence, you are always sure to find it in the church. Jesus said, when two or three or four or more of you are gathered in my name, I'm there in the midst of you. The church is where uh, people experience what God is like. Is like. You know, when Jesus is, was in the world, he said, I am the light of the world. Jesus showed us the love of the Father. He showed us the mercy, the compassion of the Father, the goodness of the Father, the transforming power of the Father. But when Jesus left the world, he said to us, now you are the light of the world. And we carry on that work of Christ. The last thing I want to tell you about the church is that the church is God's agent of salvation on the earth. Do you know the work of salvation is not finished? Now, the work of the cross is definitely finished. Jesus said it is finished. The old covenant is finished. The payment for the penalty of sin is finished. The redemptive work of Christ on the cross is finished. It was a once and for all sacrifice, an eternal sacrifice. Jesus' suffering and death is finished. The resurrection is finished. The ascension is finished. But God's plan of salvation isn't finished. You see, there's one more step beyond the cross, and that is the spread of the good news to the ends of the earth, and that is where you and I come in. You know, the Great Commission is just as necessary to the plan of salvation as the cross. Because of what benefit is the death of Jesus if no one hears of it? Well, of what benefit is the death of Christ on the cross if people don't know that he died? We support uh, our missionaries in Kenya, the Chessiers, and a while back ago, uh, quite a number of years now, they reached a group of Maasai people that had never heard the gospel before, and they shared the gospel with them. And the chief of the tribe broke down when they told them the story of God's love and the cross and what God has done. And he said, if this is such good news, why did it take you so long to get here to tell us about it? Paul said, how shall they be saved unless they hear? And how shall they hear unless someone tells them? And how shall someone tell them unless he is sent? And the way that they're sent is through the church. We need to get a revival of theology about the church. I want to tell you something, that the work that we do right here is the most important work in the whole world. This is the greatest cause that ever was. Do you know what? There will always be a church. Do you know that? From Pentecost forward, there will always be a church. No other name in history has drawn fire like the name of Jesus. No other 
group is persecuted like the church of Jesus, and yet the church remains unstoppable. World religions have opposed us, yet the church remains unstoppable. Governments have banned us, and yet the church remains unstoppable. Secular society has sidelined us, and yet the church remains unstoppable. Christians are being tortured, martyred for their faith all around the world, and yet the church remains unstoppable. Kings and kingdoms have come and gone, and yet the church remains unstoppable. Empires have risen and fallen, and yet the church remains unstoppable. Caiaphas is gone, but the church is alive. Caesar is gone, but the church is alive. Communism is gone, but the church is alive. Colonialism and the British Empire is gone, but the church is alive. And if American exceptionalism goes, guess what? The church will still be alive. I've read to the end of the book, and all that remains at the end of the book is the spirit and the bride saying, come, the church endures all the way to the end. One thing I've learned about the church in 38 years, the church has a lot more resolve than people think. The church is a lot more resilient than people think. The church has a lot more ability to remain relevant than people think. Do you know why? Because our ability to remain relevant doesn't rely upon the creativity of men. It relies upon the power of the Holy Spirit, who's always relevant. The church is a lot more adaptable than people think. The church is a lot more flexible than people think. The church is a lot more sustainable than people think. The church is a lot more, to loyal, is a lot more loyal to Jesus than people think. And we're a lot more loyal to one another than people think. If you want to help us, oppose us. If you want to make us stronger, threaten us. If you want to make us bolder, tell us to be quiet. If you want us to grow, persecute us. Try us, and you'll discover that we are quite unstoppable. Now, what I'd like to do is I'd like us to spend a few minutes this evening praying for this church. And we have an urgent need right now. We are urgently in need of phase two, our new sanctuary. We've been working on this. We had a master plan that we started in 1998. Step one was the acquisition of this land. Step two was the construction of phase one, this building. Uh, we've had a couple of intermediate steps along the way. Now it's time to finish the plan. And I wanna say we desperately need this new building. So we need it just to accommodate how big this family has grown already and we need it to keep doing the work that God has called the church to do. We need to start immediately. The zoning approvals that we have will expire at the end of the winter unless the foundation is in the ground. And if we have a winter that's anything close to last winter, you might know that winter is not a good time for building, which means we have to start now while the weather's good. And I will tell you that we have an immediate need for $3 million, which is the cost of the foundation and the basement level of the new building. We need it now. And so, you know, we need the Lord to come in. I've been watching people walk the line all week and it's just blessed my heart. And, uh, you know, to people who look in from the outside, they, they might say, ah, what, what's that going to do, walking around in circles? Well, people have walked around in circles. God's people have walked around in circles before, and uh, it had a pretty big bang at the end. So this is what I want us to do. I want to ask everybody who's physically able, if you would join me, and we're going to walk right out the door. And we're going to go out, and I want us to go prayer walk the perimeter of phase two together. Now, we can't pray together, uh, all of us corporately, uh, outside because uh, of the open air and the air conditioners running and all of those things. So what I want you to do is I want you to get a walking partner, one or two or three. And uh, I want us to go out and walk the lines. And I want you to pray with me to Abba.
to our Father and to just ask God to supply that $3 million immediately and to supply everything that's needed for the construction of this new building. I want to tell you, it is okay to pray for a building. It's a spiritual thing to pray for the building that's going to house the great work of the kingdom of God. So we get up on your feet with me this evening. Um, you can use this door or you can use uh, the back doors. With my Savior, there's no fear. In the arms of my Jesus, cause perfect love cast out fear. I know that perfect love cast out fear. I know that perfect love cast out fear. I know that perfect love cast out fear. Come on, just lift that up. And perfect love cast out fear. I know that perfect love cast out fear. And perfect love cast out fear. I know that perfect love cast out fear. Is in your prayer. All fear is gone.